So toxic substances are actually not evenly distributed in the environment because they move in many, many different specific ways. So the water running off from the land, right, they often transport toxicants from a large area and then concentrate them into the small volumes of the surface at water. So in the analytical environment uh, analysis of water, we always go for surface water first, the deposition of potential toxins in the runoff. Now, the waste water treatment plants also act the toxins, you know, factories, pharmaceuticals, and the detoxification products from the humans to the waterways. Now, if the chemicals, they persist in the soil, what happens? They will leach into the groundwater and then contaminate the drinking water supplies. So we are very thankful that in Singapore we have a very strong PUB system, the pipings are not corroded. They always do inspections to make sure that we do not have contamination in our drinking water supply. Now many chemicals are soluble in water and then they enter the organism's tissues through drinking or absorption. Now because of these, so the aquatic animals like fish and frog, right? We eat them, so there are effective indicators of pollution. So when these aquatic organisms, right, become sick or ill, and then we can see that, oh, it's actually an early warning to us that something is not right. And if the scientists conduct tests and find that there's low concentration of pesticides harming the frogs, the fish, invertebrates, we can potentially think that, okay, this is a warning to the people, you know, that we could be next because we are feeding on them. And we know that once the toxic substances arrive somewhere, it might degrade quickly or become harmless, or it might just remain unchanged and then persist for many, many months, years, or even decades. Now, the rate at which a given substance degrades depends on the chemistry and on the factors like temperature, pH, you know, moisture, sun exposure. And persistent synthetic chemicals, they are actually existing in our environment, a lot of them because we have designed them to persist. Persist means what well, doesn't degrade so easily. And that's the whole point because we make them to be more durable, if not customers will complain. So for instance, we have the plastics, right? We use a lot of plasticizers because we like them to resist breaking down. But we know that sooner or later, that most toxicants will degrade into simpler compounds, right? You know, because of the heat, you know, you have bomb breaking, you have hydrolysis. So we call these small compounds after the breakdown, right? Breakdown products. And although these breakdown products are less harmful than the original substance, but sometimes they could even be just as toxic or even more toxic than before. Like maybe I give an example here. So for DDT, right? The very famous uh, pesticides, it breaks down into DDE, a very highly persistent and toxic chemicals on its own. Now we got to understand that, right? The toxicants may also accumulate and move up the food chain. So of the toxic substances that the organisms absorb, they breathe in, they consume or drink, some, you know, of course they are being excreted into the urine system, you know, or the feces, or some are just degraded into harmless breakdown products. But there are others which will persist intact in the body, you know, they do not go any alteration. So the substances, right, they are very fat soluble or the oil soluble, they contain organic compounds like DDT and DDE. Their structures you can tell, right, with a couple of benzene rings there. They are likely to reside, reside in the fatty issues. And these kind of uh, persistent toxicants may accumulate in the animal's body in a process called what? Bioaccumulation, where we gather all these biological toxicants, right, over time. And this effect will cause the animal's tissues to have a greater concentration of the substance that exists than in the surrounding environment. The toxic substances that accumulate biologically right, in the organism's tissue might be transferred to the other organisms, you know, because the predators consume prey, we eat, we are herbivore, omnivore, we eat meat. And when one organism consumes the other guy, the predator will take in any stored toxicants and store them in themselves. So you eat them, of course, we carry out the good things, the proteins, the fats, right, the sugar, but then whatever toxins there is, we also bring them along. This is what kind of a, one kind of a bias justification of people who go vegan or who eat veggies only. Oh, you know, meat contains a lot of toxins. I don't eat it, you get a healthier life. But, you know, this is up to you to debate. Bioaccumulation itself, right, takes place in all the trophic levels in the food chain. And in addition, so each of these individuals consume as many individuals from a trophic level, believe it. Like, you know, humans, right, you have different kinds of meat, you know, pork, um, mutton, beef, you know, <coughs> birds, chicken, 
So, and with each step of the food chain, the concentration of the toxicants become like magnified. So we call them biomagnification, right? And the top predators, right, like the birds of the prey, end up having the highest concentration of the pesticides because the concentration becomes magnified, right, as the DDT move up from the water to the algae, to the plankton, to the small fish, to the larger fish, and then finally to the fish eating birds. I've not shown here, but you can see, right, like from planktons all the way up. Now, in the Arctic, what do you think about? Polar bear, that's right, this is the polar bear. They are at the top of the food chain. They feed on, what? They feed on seal, okay? Not the singer. And they feed on the fish, in the smaller fish and the planktons. So, you know, this kind of polar bear, very cute, they actually contain a lot of biomagnified toxicants, right? And although we like to think that, oh, in the Arctic, right, there's no factories, plants, no pharmaceutical companies, remote location. But the polar bears of the Svalbard Island in the Arctic, Norway, they show extremely high levels of the PCB contamination. Why? Because biomagnification and this concentrating effect of global distillation. So the polar bear curbs, right, they suffer actually very bad immune suppression, no hormone disruption and high mortality. It's not very easy to find a lot of polar bear due to this reason. And because the cups, they receive the PCB from the mother's milk, the contamination persists and then accumulate across the generations. Very, very tragic. Now, toxic substances can threaten the ecosystem services. How so? They can alter the biological composition of the ecosystem by changing the population of the prey, predator, and hence the trophic levels. And it will also affect the manner in which the organisms interact with one another in the environment. So imagine we have a disease, right, that wipes out all the cows in that particular region of the world. What happens? Can we live without any cow? Uh, possibly yes, but then we will go on and you know, have our other protein supply sources by maybe having some mutton or switch in the diet. It is the adaptation of the diet. For instance, the pesticide exposure, right, it was determined as a factor in which the recent declines in the honeybee population. So the honeybees, we know, pollinates over 100, about 100 economically important crops, and they reduce the pollination by the wild bees. And because of the pesticide exposure, there is a huge reduction in the pollination by the wild bees, right? That has increased the cost for farmers by, you know, forcing them to hire professional beekeepers to try to pollinate their crops. Without pollination, what happened? You have less fertilization, right, of the plants. Dries up cost. Dries up the cost of our food. And increase our unhappiness. Mm -hmm.